You'll want to make sure that they recognize their own resilience. And other individuals, especially if somebody is codependent, you're going to want to uh, make sure that uh, they feel uh, they recognize the fact that they, they, could be they should be empowered. And that's, of course, the strength that you're trying to give them is empowerment. Oh, I forgot about the ecological one. Uh, a lot of people don't really fit into their environment. Let me give you a quick story. I, I was thinking about this uh, as I was preparing this lecture. I was thinking about my brother. Uh, I have a brother that, uh, my older brother actually, um, he always wanted to be a farmer. That's all he wanted, uh, that's all he ever wanted to do was be a farmer. Really smart, smart kid. But all he wanted to do was be a farmer. In his yearbook, they had them uh, talk about what they were going to do for the rest of their lives. And, and in, his, in the yearbook, he said, I want to own the largest farm in Indiana. Uh, and that's, that's what he said, as, as odd as that may seem. Uh, he'd been farming all of his life, loved it, loved being outside in the dirt, uh, loved working with machines. I mean, he liked the smell of gasoline. I, there's something wrong with that. Anyway, that's all he ever wanted to do. So he, <laughs> so he marries this lady <clears throat> from Anderson. Um, we, we grew up in an area in between two, two factory towns, Muncie and Anderson. Uh, and we own a farm in between. Uh, so he marries a, a lady from Anderson. And her father was a factory worker. Uh, and so he, she took him, he took her away from, from all that, uh, that uh, smelly, day-to-day -day stuff. I mean, in farming, everything, it's different every day. Everything's different every day. And of course, in the factory, everything's the same every day. You do the same work, you work on the same machine, you, you make the same movements over and over and over again. So he took her away from all that. And uh, so he uh, started working on a farm. This is after he graduated from Purdue with a bachelor's degree in, in uh, <laughs> Uh, agricultural engineering, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> so my brother graduates from Purdue. Uh, he goes to work on a farm. Uh, it's a wonderful farm. It's like 500 acres, and it's all corn and wheat and soybeans. And he's got livestock to play with. And, and oh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful situation. So uh, one night uh, it rained, and uh, one of their drainage ditches clogged up with, with, uh, with detritus, with, with logs and sticks and stuff. So they had to go and clean it out. Well, it wasn't quite as easy as they thought it was going to be because the, uh, uh, there was a, a filter over, over the drainage pipe, and they had to, they had to pull it out, and it, it had gotten sideways. So they had to pull it out and re-weld it. That's what they had to do. Anyway, so it was like, like 2 or 3 in the morning, and uh, all of a sudden they see uh, police cars and ambulances headed toward, uh, toward his house. And of course my brother just about has a heart attack. What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? So <laughs> he, he jumps on the tractor and they take off for his house, and they get to his house, and what has happened, uh, his wife has called the police. Uh, she's sure he's dead someplace. I know. She's sure he's dead someplace because it's three o'clock in the morning and he's not there with her. And she just doesn't, she can't fathom the fact that he's out working. He told her where he was going. Of course, that was four hours before. So she's, she called the police and she, she said that she thinks that he's dead someplace. So they, they not only brought the police, but they also brought the ambulance. I know. As strange as that is. And that's the last time he ever worked on a farm because she couldn't handle the stress of not knowing exactly where her husband was every second of the day. I know. So uh, it, was, it was a situation where, where he fit, but she didn't fit. So in order to stay married, they, uh, he left the farm. He left the farm and started working in all kinds of odd odd jobs, and he's had trouble ever since. Um, well, he wants to be a farmer. I mean, so he's, he's miserable, but at least she's functional now, kind of. Anyway, that's the story of my brother. <laughs> uh, if you've ever driven on the interstate, you can thank my brother. 
because uh, he developed a plan f uh, to keep uh, semi-trailers full. Uh, before they used to deadhead, uh, so you would, uh, if you carted something across the country, as soon as they unloaded your stuff, you would take your, your uh, empty semi-trailer back, back home, and it was called deadheading. Uh, of course, it wouldn't cost as much money because there's not as much, uh, you weren't, wouldn't burn as much gas in it. But the problem was, of course, all those empty trailers, they, they wigwagged all over the, the road, sometimes they were dangerous, and they were all, it really all depended. But he uh, uh, came up with a plan so that they could pick up another load wherever they were, even if it wasn't from the same company. That's, that was his plan. The problem before had to do with insurance. And uh, he developed a plan where the company that was shipping would pay the insurance instead of the, train, the carrier. Before the carrier would pay the insurance. Anyway. Nice. So, you, yeah, you can thank my brother. <laughs> All those trailers not wigwagging all over the all over the road. Sometimes they just drop the trailer and they would uh, they just uh, drive the uh, tra tractor back, you know, the, the, the truck back without anything on the back of it, which is a huge waste of money. Yeah, just a huge waste of money. Okay, we're talking about the uh, empowerment perspective. Um, and of course, uh, you would use the empower, uh, empowerment perspective if you had an individual uh, that was uh, codependent, an individual that didn't, uh, uh, didn't recognize the fact that uh, they had power unto themselves. A lot of times you'll see a, a select individual who will uh, leave their birth family and they'll go right into another family and they will never be in charge of their own lives. Uh, there's always somebody telling them. That. These individuals uh, are, are lacking empowerment. Uh, they don't recognize the fact that they can, they can make their own decisions and, and do their own thing. Uh, last night I went to Snowflake and drove back last night, but uh, I was empowered to, to eat wherever the hell I wanted to eat. <laughs> so after, after I picked up my car, I went to uh, Belly Button. I don't know if you've ever been to Belly Button, but there's an Arby's in Belly Button, and I picked up an Arby's. And doggone it, I wanted a cherry turnover, and they didn't have one again. The last time I was there, they didn't have any cherry turnovers. And this time, they didn't have any cherry turnovers either. Why don't you just have an apple? Are apples and cherries the same thing? They're not. They come two no. Apples are white on the inside, and cherries are red on the inside. It was after red. That's what I was at. Anyway. So I was empowered last night to eat wherever the hell I wanted to eat, and I did. Uh, these individuals, select individuals, of course, they don't recognize uh, the fact that they can, uh, that they have the strength, that they they have the right uh, to uh, to make their own decisions. Internal components of empowerment uh, is also called. We already talked about this. Yeah. It's called psychological empowerment, control over your motivations, your thoughts, and your personality. Uh, you don't have to act. You can act any way you want. You can be any person that you want to be. Uh, this is something I d discovered uh, after uh, I left home. Uh, I lived in a, in a town that was relatively religious, uh, and because it was religious, they, they kind of tried to dictate to you how you were supposed to act, and I didn't recognize the fact that I could be anybody that I wanted to be. I mean, it was like everybody's a Stepford wife or something. I mean, everybody's in lockstep with everybody else. They're all acting like good Methodists, whatever a good Methodist is. <laughs> anyway, so when I went away to college, all of a sudden I realized I could be anybody I wanted. I could cut my hair any way I wanted to. When I was in high school, they made us uh, cut our hair in a buzz cut because they weren't going to have any hippies at their, at their <laughs> high school. Anyway, once I went away to college, I could do anything that I wanted. And I, I, I realized that uh, every time you go someplace new, you can be, you can change your personality. <laughs> you can be anybody that you want to be. Nobody knows who the hell you are. Nobody's ever seen you before. So you, you might have been a jackass back home, but now you, could, you can be anybody you want to be. Or maybe you were a nice guy back home, now you can be a jackass. There you go, you can change your personality. I know. <laughs> uh, internal empowerment involves a belief that the individual will make competent decisions, solve their problems, achieve their goals, and have a significant impact on the environment. And of course, that's, 
what my brother did despite the fact that he didn't do what he wanted to do. Uh, which is a tragedy if you think about it. He wanted to be a farmer. That sucks. I know, and I don't know why he let that lady. So They're still married. She, well, well, what does she do now that she's comforted by the fact that he's there all the time now? She's nuts. She's just crazy as a loon. And she's always been crazy as a loon. And she uses her insanity to control him. And that's that just, why she was upset in the first place. That's right. She didn't have total control, control. over it. I know. They've been married for like 50, let's see, 51 years. They've been married for 51 years. Should pick his religion too? <laughs> <laughs> She's not a religious person. Yeah, oh, luckily okay, they, they didn't. They, yeah, they didn't have that going okay. against them. <laughs> the external component of empowerment includes the tangible knowledge, uh, competencies, uh, skills, information, opportunities, and resources that allow the person to take action and actively advocate change. So that's uh, the external component of empowerment. Uh, empowerment like resilience is a process as well as an outcome. New competencies learned from experience leads to a new, new feelings of empowerment. Research shows that the more involved an individual, the stronger the feeling of empowerment. And of course, one of the things that a lot of individuals will do uh, is that they will try to get you to make the decision. That way, if, it, if it's wrong, it's exactly, it's your fault, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Uh, so, and that's part of codependency. Uh, codependency uh, is the fact that they never take responsibility for, they never have to take responsibility for anything. Uh, so even though they, they seem like a, a, a wimpy person that, that can't make a decision, the reality is they're afraid to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And they want to blame somebody else, even though they don't articulate the fact that somebody else made that mistake. A lot of times these individuals will accumulate all this information, all these bad decisions that somebody else has made, and then all of a sudden once the argument starts, they dump it all, all this, they dump all this stuff <laughs> on the individual that made the wrong decision, which is always fun. The empowerment perspective allows clients to develop a sense of power and competency as they experience using their skills and knowledge in new and challenging ways. Now you, I need to warn you about this. Um, if, they, if they accept the empowerment that you have given them, all of a sudden, yeah, they're going to be responsible for themselves, exactly. And they, will want, they don't want to do that. They would rather blame somebody else. They would rather blame everybody else, or anybody else, or that select person that has always made their decisions for them, whether it's a parent or whether it's a spouse. Um, it's, it's a lot easier when you're not uh, responsible for anything that happens. The empowerment perspective helps people discover their strengths. It identifies their goals and, de and develop a plan to reach their goals, allowing clients to accept responsibility. And there's the problem right there. This, this is a huge word. It's more gigantic than, than I put it on the board. Responsibility is something that uh, a lot of people try to stay away from. They don't want to be responsible for anything. If they are responsible, then they are to blame. Especially if they grew up in a home where uh, they were, people were always trying to find somebody to blame. I don't know if you've ever seen a family like that, but there's always there's a lot of finger pointing, and uh, they they tend to have a scapegoat. Uh, it's usually one of the middle children is the scapegoat. The baby never makes the mistake. The the golden child, the older child, never makes a mistake. It's always somebody in the middle, and so. That's divorce. funny because my husband is a middle child and he's like that, and I'm the right. oldest child, and the golden, I'm the golden yeah, child. So. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and watching that family dynamic, you know, it usually comes in in families that are larger not in number, right. like six to eight kids. Right. You know? And he does have a lot of stories like that. So it's funny. Somebody else did something and he got blamed. He gets blamed for it. Or he has to fix it. Yeah. Even though he's like, it's not within his capability to fix exactly. it. He still has to fix it. So yeah. now he, he has <clears throat> he has this thing to where he's always taking his sibling's problems and making it his problem. And I always have to remind him, like, dude, when have your siblings taken any of your problems and made it theirs? I was like, never. They've never had I was to. like, so it's okay, you know, let it go. They're adults, they can handle it. 
It's like you're not allowing them to feel or struggle on their own. That's why they keep dumping this on you. That's right. Because they got to let them feel it, uh, let them go through it, let them struggle, just watch from afar, you know, just catch the babies, you know, right. but let the adults go. <laughs> right. Yeah, let, let them make their own mistakes. Yeah. Of course, but they won't, of course, because they'll never take responsibility. The self-accountability to take that responsibility. Right. Yeah. It is a tragedy. So I hope you're all middle children. <laughs> uh, you are the responsible ones. But the dual perspective of views an individual as interacting and adapting to two surrounding systems of, or environments. Uh, there is a nurturing environment which is composed of your family, your friends, and close associates at school or work. The people that you're the closest to, the people that nurture you. This is your nurturing environment. And hopefully your nurturing environment is a nurturing environment. As I told you, I uh, just read uh, Crazy Rich Asians, uh, and uh, there was no nurturing environment among the wealthy people. They didn't nurture one another. Uh, it was almost... Uh, yeah, it was very conflictual. Every, everything was a conflict. Uh, they were always trying to undercut each other. They were, all, they were always trying to stab each other in the back. Uh, to to gain uh, position in the family wealth structure. Uh, yeah. So you can imagine there was no nurturing <laughs> taking place. They had uh, even their friends were were always com they were competing with their friends. They were competing with they're not with everyone. They're adversaries. Uh, yeah, but they s interacted a lot. So you would think that they would would be they friends. Were friends. But they were always competing with one another, and this one lady uh, had, had a fashion sense that nobody else had, so nobody wanted to hang around with her because she always was better dressed than everybody else, so nobody would have anything to do with her. Uh, so she was completely isolated from everybody else. And whenever she went to a party, you know, she would make an appearance in, in her clothes, and, and everybody would point at her, you know, that's, that's the lady that, all, that has the fashion sense. And everybody would stay away from her like she was poison. <laughs> because she was, a, I don't mean, know. The, the whole idea was, you have friends, right? Okay. You have friends, and they're nice to you, and you got have their back, and they've got your back, but in this case, nobody had anybody's back. And of course, everybody was trying to backstab that other lady. The lady that was so attractive and you know yada 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 okay so that's the nurturing environment the sustaining environment consists of the people encountered in the wider community and broader society okay <clears throat> so you've got you've got the your your family and friends the people that that uh, sustain you and then you've got your sustaining environment that's that's the uh, environment uh, in toto uh, so my sustaining environment is uh, is Diné College, and all the individuals that I interact with, my colleagues, uh, the the administration. That's my sustaining environment. My nurturing environment is all my my uh, family, which is way up in Iowa. But it's all you guys. You're you're all my friends and my close associates. <laughs> you're the ones I want to interact with. <laughs> I try to stay away from everybody else. <laughs> but you're you're you're. I, I have a lot of fun with you guys, so I appreciate that. Uh, while most Ameri uh, European Americans experience nurturing and sustaining environments as fitting together, other ethnic and racial groups experience a poor fit between them. And if you've ever lived off the reservation, you know what I'm talking about. So you live in, a, in the dominant society, you live in another society, and a lot of times uh, you don't feel sustained. You don't feel like they're, you're being supported by the outside environment. If you've only been here, then, then these two fit together for you. But if you've ever been off the reservation, if you've ever lived in Phoenix or Flagstaff or, or in, uh, Albuquerque, Timbuktu, Tucumcari, <laughs> with all their guns, uh, if you've ever lived any place else, you, you may not feel like, you, you may have felt like the, the environment was, uh, was dangerous. Has everybody lived off the reservation? Is there anybody that hasn't lived off the reservation? Okay, so everybody's lived off the reservation, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, people look at you differently. Uh, I was, I, um, Marius and I just drove down to uh, Snowflake, and uh, Snowflake is a, it's not just a white community, it's also a Mormon community. So, um, and he's of course native, I don't know if you noticed it. But 
<laughs> and his wife is, and all of his kids are. And they're some of the only native kids in the school. And it's tough. It's really tough for them. Uh, it's different, and you don't, maybe you don't even think about it, but of course he does because he grew up in that environment. He grew up in Snowflake, so he understands exactly what's going on. But his wife uh, didn't. Uh, she grew up in Utah in a Mormon community, but uh, she was adopted. Okay, well, anyway, not at this point. So she felt, her, she feels differently about the, about the environment and about the community, mm -hmm. and, and his kids are having a little bit of trouble interacting with, uh, with the, the people in general. And um, so he suggested, which, you know, this is fairly superficial, but I mean, if you get into athletics, then sometimes you can, you can be accepted. But you shouldn't have to do that, should you? No. People should just accept you for who you are. You don't have to be the stud basketball player. Well, them being in athletics, you know, it really wouldn't solve it. Because, like, my son, he was in basketball over at Navajo Prep, and his hair was down past his butt. So when they would play, and they'd be playing against these big farm boys, you know, They'd be like, hey, chief, or hey, you know. But yeah, it just doesn't. Isn't it odd the words that they use trying to get into people's heads? Mm -hmm. It's just ugly, isn't it? So he cut his hair. He cut his hair. Oh, no. That's a tragedy. Individuals in non-dominant groups uh, constantly evaluate disappointments in life to determine whether they are based on one's qualifications or on racism from the dominant culture. Racism is always a possibility. Do we still have racism in the United States? Oh, yes. Oh, my God, I didn't realize. Stupid. I, I was, I've been listening to Donald Trump, and I thought there wasn't any more. <laughs> Minority members must uh, develop a dual perspective equating disappointments with the hostility of the broader society, and there is a degree of hostility. And this is something that you need to recognize. And this is something that you have to deal with, sadly enough. <clears throat> Minority members must constantly shift between the home culture and the dominant culture to choose acceptable behavior in each situation. This is, a, this is something that's real. This guy started acting white and he got a job right away. <clears throat> that's a possibility. Oh, this, yeah. this is a very real thing. <clears throat> they don't want you to act like, you're, like you do at home. And some people are really surprised when people start talking differently when they're around other individuals. Uh, uh, this is something that Barack Obama had to be very careful of. He, uh, of course, his wife is from Chicago. And he's from Hawaii, as odd as that sounds. But, uh, he had to be very careful about when he used the black, black patois. It couldn't be in public. Uh, or if it was in public, it had to be in public where there were a lot of African Americans so that it would be accepted the way that he was talking. Uh, whenever he talked to the American people, he certainly didn't use his black patois. He was very, very careful about that. And of course, I don't know. I don't know how you can look at this. I, it, it's, it's really, is it superficial that, uh, that he didn't talk the way he wanted to talk all the time? Or it, what, was it uh, survival? Was it, did it have something to do with survival? I would say survival. Probably. Yeah. Anyway. So you may have experienced the same thing. You may have acted differently uh, when you're in the dominant society. Uh, you may have, uh, have talked differently. You may have acted differently. You may have, I don't know what you would have done. Anyway, we sometimes, sometimes people have to do that. The dual perspective, of course, I don't have to worry about that. Or do I have to? While I'm here, I'm a minority. Wait a minute. <laughs> so do I... Do I have to act different? Do I act different in Iowa than I do in, in do Arizona? <laughs> Here you eat piccadillies, there you don't. <laughs> no, I don't eat piccadillies ever. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Boy, but I do eat dill pickle potato chips. Mm -hmm. Dill potato chips? 
Have you ever tasted them? Oh, they're, they're good. good. They're good. I know. The ketchup, really good. potato chips. I don't know. I haven't tried yeah. the ketchup. Uh, the dual perspective allows a practitioner to attempt to understand the structural barriers that those in the other groups experience. The perspective makes the practitioner aware of the day-to-day -day challenges minority clients face. One of the reasons that uh, one of the reasons that they have to talk about this all the time, and we will we will see them uh, talking about uh, about minorities and how you have to treat minorities and how you have to deal with minorities. The reason they're doing this is because if you look at your authors, one of them may potentially be Chinese, but she may just be married to somebody who's Chinese. Uh, but what, the other two are probably white. These individuals are from Indiana. Indiana has about uh, six percent African American population. Uh, so, and most of the, the people that they're teaching at the university, Indiana University, uh, are white. Most of their students are white. And a lot of these white students have never been around black people. Even in Indianapolis, where there is a relatively large population of African Americans, the schools are not segregated, but they're local. So if you live in a white neighborhood, you probably don't only see a handful of African Americans. So you haven't really grown up with African Americans. If you live in Crown Point, Indiana, Crown Point, Indiana is like 99% <coughs> white. Uh, so there are a lot of communities in Indiana where there are no African Americans. So a lot of their students have never interacted with, with a, anybody who is a minority. And I can assure you they haven't interacted with anybody who is native, mainly because there are very few natives in Indiana, and the ones that are, are there are white people that claim to be. Okay, anyway. <laughs> mm. I know, <laughs> we won't go into that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so there you go. Uh, so we're going to see this a lot, and we're going to be talking about this a lot, and it's mainly because these individuals are dealing with a, a primarily white population uh, at Indiana University, and uh, that is why they have to articulate this, because um, back in the 20s, back, in the, uh, back at the turn of the century, uh, when they first started uh, uh, working with, uh, with individuals, uh, social work, especially in the South, uh, they didn't do a very good job of dealing with minorities. And because of that, uh, of course, since they're trying to help people, uh, they, need to, uh, they need to articulate the fact that, that not everybody is, is white, is lily white and acts the same. As odd as that may seem. Okay. Now we're going to talk about ethics. <laughs> ah, I am so clever sometimes. See this picture? Okay. You'll see that picture again. <laughs> I don't know where I came up with this stuff. I, sometimes I amaze myself. Okay, so we're going to talk about ethics. This chapter is about ethics, uh, values, ethics, and legal obligations of the, uh, of the counselor. Uh, values are preferred, they're conceptions of people, outcomes for people, ways of dealing with people. Those are our values, uh, the ones that we maintain. Our personal <coughs> values influence our view of the world, what you think of the world, uh, your personal and professional philosophies and choices. And we all do have professional uh, philosophies and choices. I was, uh, I was over at uh, Marius' house and all of his boys were uh, playing video games. Even the four-year-old was playing a video game. It's really kind of weird. And so I started talking to them, and uh, <laughs> they started telling me about their video games, which I thought was a little odd. So why am I talking about this? Oh, we're talking about values of the world. View, their view of the world is really kind of odd. The, the four-year-old was talking about Foxy, some game with Foxy in it. And then he, and Pennywise, something about Pennywise. This, Pennywise in a game? So he, she started explaining Pennywise to me. Is Pennywise a clown that mm -hmm. murders people? Or, it. I'm sorry? From the book? It? it? Yeah. Yeah. Pennywise. yeah. I don't know. It must be in a game. Because this kid was talking about Pennywise. This is the oddest thing in the world. And Foxy. And then he started explaining all of these characters in this game <coughs> to me. Anyway, so I thought, well, your worldview is a little skewed there, young man. <laughs> and the whole time they were playing video games, they're all three playing video games, they're watching a movie on television, this huge television screen. They were watching, uh, what was it, 
Oh, I can't remember the movie. They were, they were doing two things at one time. I thought that was a little odd. And then I started having a conversation, and they're still playing their games and watching television <laughs> and having a conversation with me. That was a little odd. <clears throat> Okay, so what are was you talking about? Was it odd or was it kind of disturbing to you? Uh, it was fairly disturbing to me because, they, for one thing, they weren't paying any attention to me, which is okay. I'm, I'm used to not being paid attention to, but uh, they, were, they were saying things and I wasn't exactly sure if they were sit, talking to me or they were talking to the television or they were talking to the, te the, the, the uh, video game. With my sister, you know, she um, plays video games. Good. And her, her and her whole family, they're just like straight up video. But they wear those um, headpieces oh. and they're talking to people. So sometimes you think they're talking to you because you come from a culture where people talk to you. Actually, converse. and they're and they're not. And my sister's like, oh, she's talking to her friend, and I'm like, oh, okay, you know. But I find it disturbing how some parents use the tablets and the, right. you know, everything for the little kids to keep them occupied. Right. We used to use television and now <clears throat> they use video games and television in the background. But you can go to the airport and you've got people with those things or just things stuck in their ears. And they're walking along just having this conversation with somebody like they're schizophrenic. Like they're nuts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, and it's a loud conversation. And then you just feel stupid when you say, mm -hmm. when you like try and right. talk with them and everything, and they're like, oh, I'm on the phone. Or, or they act like you just, oh, what are you doing? Oh, my goodness gracious, how dare you talk to me? I'm and then it's kind of like you regret that you even visit. <laughs> it puts you in that position where you're like, um, why did I even come here? <laughs> what is, what's going on in the world? We're not even interacting with each other. Professional values often include principles of respect, self-determination, social justice, professional integrity. Uh, so we have professional values, we have personal values, and I can't remember what the other one was. Anyway, uh, areas where personal values may conflict with professional values include religion, of course. Religion is, 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 one of, is huge because we're trying to decide uh, about a uh, Supreme Court justice, whether mm -hmm. Brett Kavanaugh gets to join the Supreme Court or not. And religion seems to, to have a lot to do with what's going on right now. There's just a lot of religious conflict going on. Uh, health, uh, health care. Uh, there's a huge argument in the United States over whether we're going to, to maintain uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so health is, is, is a huge uh, conflict. Uh, and it may have, uh, may, your personal values and your professional values may not mix. Uh, marriage and family. Uh, does everybody have to be married? If you live no. together, do you have to be married? No. If you have a baby, do you have to be married to the person that made that baby? No. Oh, sure. <laughs> marriage and family. Education. Uh, there are some individuals that don't believe in education. They don't think it's necessary. My, gra my grandfather didn't believe in education. He uh, dropped out of school in the third grade. Because he had enough, he could add and subtract, he could read, read and write, so he was done. He was ready to go off and make his fortune, but he never did. Uh, role of the government, of course, is another uh, argument. Uh, birth and death. Well, let's talk about role in government. Okay. Right now we have um, Joe Shirley, who picked his, picked, in, picked his vice president, who's half Japanese and half Navajo. Okay. So I, I heard there's like a lot of controversy over that. Then you have Jonathan Mez who picked an older guy who's full Navajo. And everyone, I think, oh, I don't, I'm not Navajo, but I see a lot of um, controversy with the guy that's half, half Navajo, but he speaks Navajo really good. And okay. he's got a really good education and stuff, and so the role of government <coughs> here is a little different. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. So how important is education? Are we looking for somebody with a PhD? No, to be? I don't think it's very, I mean, they say it's important, you know, based off of the, what Manny Lito said, you know, sure. kind of ladder of education. Sure. You know, but then again, when it comes down to people, like she was saying, that have these, you know, the education that has the degree, that has the experience to go into these positions, 
and actually do some good, make some changes, they're threatened by that. They're always threatened by that. Isn't that interesting? I'm and then it's even more so if it's a female, but then even more so if that person is only half Navajo. And then, like she was saying, to, you know, Joe Shirley's running mate, you know, being half Navajo and then being able to speak Navajo and understand Navajo right. and articulate and converse and do business in Navajo, as opposed to Jonathan Nez's for vice president, who was actually purged says was purged with along with the thousands of Navajos that were allowed you know that got purged before voting season sure. started. But then you know he could say that but then he could have like never even voted before or never even participated in right. voting before and just used that as a scapegoat. Wow. How and that question that you know also questions, you know, for me I question, you know, Jonathan Nez, like how well does he even know the people he's gonna be working with? I mean, if you don't even know something as simple as, you know, I would, I know she votes, you know, and I, and she sits next to me, you know, and this is something we talked about. Did she you has know, to you tra vote? travel for you know, two so hours to, to vote. Yeah, <coughs> see, something as simple as that with somebody you are with every other day, what? you ask them a simple question, did you vote or not? You know, so it's like, it wasn't a personal question that he could have asked this person. And then being Navajo too, you're always taught to be prepared to be called upon for you know position of leadership, a position of responsibility. That's why you should always be ready and have your have oh. your shit squared away. Because you don't know when someone's gonna point at you and say you I want your help. You're, you're in charge. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, and it's so funny because when you were bringing this up and I'm glad you brought it up. It's at Winderock when you drive in, you know, there's that Lions Club. And yes. right there, right when you drive in. Really? And now it's like the Lions Club. I was like, wait, so the Lions Club exists in a government area, and the Lions Club is, you don't talk about government, and you don't talk about religion if you're in the Lions right. Club. That's that's the law for that. Right. I was like, so how the heck is there a Lions Club in the capital of the young Navajo Nation? Is this, you know, and it makes you question things like, is this is why our government is as screwy as it is because no one wants to talk about religion. No one wants to talk about government, so it's just a business. You know, so for me, I I notice wow. a lot of things like that just going to the Capitol. Yeah. But it yeah, it really does bring up religion and, and government, role of government, which is what the two main things that nobody ever wants to talk about on the reservation. And here outside of the reservation, that's all everybody talks about. And what are the attitudes of the Navajos that are? actively voting and voicing their opinions, you know, that's really interesting to watch, you know, cause because it's only to self, like, if it will help me, if it will help my family, it's not like for it will help this community, it will help this family here, because I know this family struggles. No, and it all, I don't know, it kind of comes back down to like, my idea, I want this, I want that, and I don't want to share it with anybody, you know, whereas they could give it those ideas to somebody that is in a position to make those changes, to somebody that has the money to make those changes happen, you know, for, for the greater good. But haven't and we then, seen that in national politics as well? I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that you, you, you are voting so that, uh, to, to help yourself, not, yeah. not to help everybody. Yeah. And then you leave the reservation and you, because I was kind of curious, like, how is everybody's attitudes off the reservation? Mm -hmm. So I was asking people, I said, um, so did you vote? And they're like, some, some ladies are like, you just, why should I vote? Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. And then one other lady was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know who to vote for, so I just voted for the first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Wait, how much thought goes into their... Yeah. The process of voting. Yeah, then one thing that um, Christine brought up in one of her um, in one of her classes, decolonization and resilience, was when she goes to um, teacher meetings. You know, and there's things that are being brought up. You know, and some teachers will be like, "Well, I supported you when you wanted this done, and you didn't support me when I wanted this. So you didn't raise your hand." You know, and she gave the answer, "Well, because I didn't have enough information, you know, for me to give a correct vote, yes or no. So that's why I, I abstained." You know, but people do really hold that against you at the chapter house level because my husband and I were two of the few young people that go to meetings and vote. So a lot of times we get a lot of backlash from community members and, and these community members are usually groups of families that own and do things, you know, so it's and my very son, tricky. 
my son went to vote and he had, I support Joe Shirley. <laughs> and um, when he went to the chapter house, they told him, yes, son, please. you can't vote here if you support Joe Shirley. Mm -hmm. um, and my son's like, well, I didn't know I was being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. You know, and after that, attitudes changed. Yeah. yeah. They didn't really say that. They did. <coughs> it was a joke. Well, I don't know, probably. I don't get to vote. I was saying that I was going to steal. Yeah, like during the voting season, or during the primary. But he's, season, he's not supposed to wear that shirt. He can wear whatever he wants to wear. No, you're not supposed to wear that shirt that close. You're not supposed to wear any advertising. They're outside advertising, though. They're feeding you outside. Okay. Yeah, yeah but. For me. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> You if can. You're coming in to vote. You can you wear it. You can but wear it. The workers that are working, the poll workers, yeah. they can't. They can't work. She worked the polls. Yeah. That's why she ah, knows. Okay. Yeah. So All she right. knows. That. That's the way it is in, in usual, in no, normally in <laughs> elections. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Birth and death, of course. Uh, these are two <laughs> huge subjects here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the questions with the new Supreme Court justice. Will he try to overturn? Will he help try to help overturn Roe versus Wade? And of course, this is something that the, the uh, more conservative people in the United States have been trying to do since 1972 when it was passed. Uh, so that's another area. And of course, honesty is another question. Ethical codes provide a, a brief explanation of what we can expect can be expected uh, in the interactions between professionals and clients as well as between professionals and other professionals. Ethical codes contain statements about what the professionals must and must not do. And there are standards. Everybody has standards. And here is a list. Uh, oh, no, not yet. Uh, yeah, oh, no, I just did that. Okay, here's a list. That's, I was right. Here, here's a list of... Uh, some of the professional organizations that you may be a part of in the future. Uh, American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy, and there is their website. American Counseling Association is another. The American, <clears throat> American Psychiatric Nurses Association, of course you have to be a nurse to be a member of that. The American Psychological Association, the APA, which most psychologists are members of. Uh, unless you are a research scientist and then they have their own uh, ethical uh, organization, but the APA. So if you're talking to somebody that uh, is a member of the uh, research organization, they don't like the APA. <laughs> they argue with the APA. It's not. It's kind of silly. Uh, the Association of Addiction Professionals, uh, the International Association of Marriage and Family Counselors, the National Association of Social Workers, if you become a social worker, and the National Organization of Human Services. Those are some of the professional organizations, and of course there are <coughs> websites uh, if you want to go and look into their ethical codes, or maybe this is the direction you want to go. They may have some suggestions as to how to get there. Professional competence includes practicing within the scope of competence based on education, training, professional credentials, and professional uh, experience. So if you've never had experience dealing with, uh, with a select individual and they've got uh, OCD uh, and you're, you're thinking of using a new technique but you've never really worked with that technique before, you really shouldn't do it. You need training in that technique before you actually use it. Uh, so that's one of the things. So your, your education, educational level your, and your training are very important as far as uh, your professional competency and integrity are concerned. One of the most important aspects of professional competence requiring uh, professional self-awareness is cultural competence. And this is a tough one because a lot of people think, uh, a lot of people believe in diversity. Diversity is the idea that everybody's the same and nobody, and one culture is no, is no better than the other. Uh, which is a nice idea, but uh, the reality is uh, uh, individuals act differently because of their culture. Uh, so you have to respect and accept their culture as a, as a given. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the problems with, with the idea of diversity is that, uh, so what culture are we talking about? What, what is the, the one culture that everybody is like? And as, of course, it turns out to be the dominant white culture. So everybody is, is everybody's just like white people. That's the idea behind diversity. And of course, we know that that's not true. 
that uh, multiculturalism is, <coughs> is, is is the way to think of things. You need to, if somebody is uh, is Asian, then you need to accept their culture. Uh, and you, you need to accept the fact that they're going to act differently than you are. And that should be acceptable behavior because that is part of their culture. It's just like some crazy missionary coming onto the reservation and trying to get you to act like them. That's just not right. And it shouldn't. Can you be racist towards one group of white people but not another group? <coughs> sure. <coughs> yeah, sure. Right. Well, think of what Donald Trump just said about uh, Jeff Sessions. <laughs> what did he call him? <laughs> he called him retarded, uh, a retarded, uh, dumb southerner. That's what he called him. Oh, my God. <laughs> the language of that. Yeah, so why are you picking if on you're people? You're like, might as well just cuss Trump's, make it easier. <laughs> yeah, why in the world would you say something like that? Anyway, okay. So cultural competence is defined as the application of cultural knowledge about individuals and groups of people to, to the standards, policies, attitudes, and practices of the helping process to result in better outcomes. If you're counseling somebody and you have no clue what their culture is all about or what their religion is all about, then you need to do a little bit of, of uh, research. You need to find out about their culture. You need to try to figure it out. Now, it may be that since they live in the United States and since... Uh, uh, and maybe they are, are uh, uh, they have been away from their own culture for generations that uh, they don't act like their, their culture potentially. But it may be that they're traditional and their family has always been traditional. Uh, therefore, you need to understand what that may, that, how that may impact these, these select individuals. So your responsibility is to understand their culture and that's one of the reasons why we're teaching cultural psychology. Uh, the, it, I'm not really trying to teach you about all of these different cultures. I'm trying to show you that different cultures act differently. That's what I'm trying to show you. So that when you get out in the, in the real world and you start interacting with somebody from Indonesia, you, you should understand that, that somebody from Indonesia may act differently than you. They may have different ideas. They're probably Muslim because Indonesia is the largest Muslim has the, is the most populous uh, Muslim country in the world. Did you know that? <laughs> mm -hmm. You've got all these Muslim countries, you've got Syria and Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, and you've got all these African countries that are, that are Muslim, and the, large, the most populous uh, Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. We had a student that was um, Muslim this summer, and, you know, I thought all Muslims were really rude and horrible and just everything you hear, you know. And he was like the most, he just had the best way to describe things, you know. And You've been listening to your neighbor too much. Oh, my God, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, he was, he was such a good person. He, would, he told me when I dropped him off at the airport. <coughs> Andrea, I pray that I never think bad or I never do any bad to to you or something like that, you know. And it was That's a Muslim prayer, by the way. Oh, is it? It is. <laughs> so, it's part of their religion. Being polite is, is part of their religion. Yeah, they're so down to earth. Yeah. I really like them. Yeah, it's really kind of cool. Uh, I was playing soccer uh, when I was, uh, we were stationed out in California, and uh, I was playing on a team with uh, a bunch of guys from uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, they were just the nicest guys in the whole wide world. And then, you know, they played the soccer game, and they were all stinky and everything. And then they would uh, they'd go to their cars, and you're thinking, well, you know, these are just college kids from Saudi Arabia. No, Mercedes, Bentley, yeah, they were wealthy, they were extremely wealthy, but they just played their hearts out on the soccer field. You wouldn't have known that they were wealthy or anything. And of course, they were very, they were very giving people. That's, that's part of their religion as well. So culture is very important, and you need to find out about the cultures. The poor Andrea, she's thinking that, that this guy's going to be just a jackass, and the reality was he's probably the least rude person well, when I was driving him down the chimney, I, I answered a text message and he told me, oh, this grandma's 
from, can, can you pull over? I'll drive while you pick. <laughs> <laughs> no more Fox News Channel for you. <laughs> it, it's her neighbor that t tells her what's on Fox News. Confidentiality is vital for information shared by the client with the therapist in the course of a treatment. This information is not to be shared with others. You need to be, when they tell you something, it, it's just between the two of you. And you can't tell anybody. You can't go home and say, let's guess what, guess what this, my client said to me. You can't do that. You can't tell anybody unless they allow you to do that. Uh, sometimes you can share the information with a colleague uh, so that you can get uh, suggestions as to how to uh, proceed with, uh, with whatever their problem is. But other than that, you can't tell anybody. It's secret. Because you put that problem on them, too. Well, in a way, it becomes their, it becomes a part of their mind track as right. well. And you know, in Navajo philosophy, that's the same thing too. You don't so tell. You, you don't gossip. Navajo You shouldn't gossip. do that because that is one thing that really does mess up another person's psyche. That's why. What it, gossiping? Yeah, that's what my grandmother always. That's what I hear I was everybody. Taught. I hear everybody gossiping. I don't know what. That's why I only gossip with you because you're not Navajo. Right? Yeah. You know, you gossip with you've already been in psychology, so that's why I gossip to you. <laughs> I was talking about you. I was talking about other people. <laughs> but yeah, though, it, that's something that, um, that co coincides with Navajo philosophy is that, you know, if you take somebody else's problem or somebody gave you a problem to help them through and you are not strong enough to handle that problem, so you talk to somebody else and you don't know if that person is weak-minded or stronger than you or not, but still in a way you have to be conscious of what you're doing there. You're putting that issue on someone else that might corrupt their way of thinking or their track, their way of living. So you don't talk to You don't talk to anybody else about your problems? Just you. Just me, no, of, course. Well, of course. <laughs> no, I mean personal problems like that if you're going to be that profession, if you're going to be that kind of wow. vessel, I guess, for somebody to be right. like a confident or something. Well, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Without confidentiality, clients are less likely to, dis to disclose sensitive information with the practitioner. If they know that you have loose lips, then they probably won't come to you to begin with. Yeah, let's, let's stay away from you. Mm -hmm. So why do you maintain confidentiality? Because the uh, potential for clients to experience stigma, uh, especially if, they, uh, if, if, if it's something that is, embarrasses them, uh, they had an affair, They've got a, an illegitimate child with a prostitute in Las Vegas, I don't know, whatever it is. They may feel stigmatized and they certainly don't want to talk to everybody and they don't want everybody to find out about their stigma. Maybe they've contracted a, a, a not venereal disease, we don't call them that anymore, a sexually transmitted infection and, and they're embarrassed about it. Uh, moral obligation for helping professionals to develop ethical standards for a professional. A uh, model uh, of acting with discretion and keeping one's word, of course, that has to do with confidentiality. And, of course, you're legally required not to disclose. Whoops, they can sue you if they find out that you've disclosed this information to somebody that they didn't authorize you to disclose <coughs> information to. You can be sued. So if you file a complaint against the an entity and the person the complaint is filed against attains the information of the complaint but isn't supposed to go to that person you can sue them right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah you have to uh, you have to sign a, a waiver in order for them to, to disclose this information yeah, to anybody this gets really kind of hairy and we're going to talk about that uh, later if the individual is under age mm -hmm. uh, there is on, there there are only certain things you can even tell their parents and, and that's the way you get them to talk to you is to, is, to, is to tell them that, that you can only give them the, uh, their parents' select information. And that has to do with confidentiality. With the expansion of technology into all aspects of our lives, communication has become, uh, has become more and more difficult to regulate. Uh, cell phones, fax machines, answering machines, computers, internet sites. Uh, I told you that I was in a, uh, an office with Dr. Garrity, uh, and I heard all of her conversations while I was there. I tried not to be in, her, in the office, which is terrible because I had to leave. I mean, I, I felt like I needed to leave. So somebody would come in to talk to Dr. Garrity, and I felt like I 
could, shouldn't be there because I could hear everything that was going on. And she whispers so loud, I swear, she <laughs> whispers really loud. Anyway, so I felt like I needed to, to leave. But not only that, if somebody, if somebody puts a message on an answering machine and they play the answering machine, uh, one of the problems with that building anyway is that uh, everything echoes. Uh, so all of a sudden you're sitting in your office and you can hear the answering machine, you know, Patrick Blackwater, who's around the corner and, and up the hallway. I can hear exactly what his wife told him about dinner tonight. You know, I'm going, I don't want to hear this. This is terrible. So answering machines, of course, they're too loud. Uh, computers, if you're walking past somebody's computer, you can look at, uh, uh, to see what, what they're looking at. You don't mean to. It's not like you care. But all of a sudden, you realize that they're watching porn pornographic movies on the confidentiality. Okay. Well, <coughs> none of That's my business. That's not confidentiality. Well, if you're working at the college and you have an employee You're not supposed to. You're not supposed yeah, to. Yeah, and... Exactly. That's, that's kind of like harassment. I know, this is terrible. Limit uh, uh, sending confidential material in, uh, by insecure means. Uh, you should, if something's confidential, you need to be very, very careful of it. Uh, as far as, uh, as you guys are concerned, uh, your student numbers are confidential. I'm not su supposed to disclose it to anybody, what, what your student number is. Uh, even your names, I'm not even supposed to uh, to give that information out. So I can't leave anything on my desk that has your name on it and your student number. Uh, that is uh, uh, against uh, FERPA. Yeah, I think it's FERPA. Yeah, it's HIPAA's the, the hospital. <laughs> Boundaries are defined as borders that separate some uh, some types of entities. For example, parents, uh, children, systems, clients, uh, service providers, and healthcare workers. There are boundaries uh, that we have to maintain. So if I am working in the emergency room, there are boundaries. I, I can't treat you like uh, I know you. That's, that's, the, that's one of the boundaries. I have to, to, I'm, I'm a medical professional, therefore I have to treat you like a patient. And uh, that's the boundary that, that has to be taken. I can't hug you. Um, uh, I can't t touch you, certainly can't touch you inappropriately. Uh, one of the things that used to happen in the old days when somebody came into the emergency room if they were unconscious, the first thing you did was strip them down to nothing. Strip them down to nothing because what you're doing is you have no idea why they're unconscious uh, so you're, and you're looking for pro potential problems so you take all their clothes off. That was the first thing that you did. We don't do that anymore. I don't think they do that anymore except in select circumstances. Uh, but in the old days, they, wow, it was, it was really kind of interesting. They just stripped them right down, and it was a little bizarre and a little unnerving. But now, of course, there, there are boundaries uh, that, uh, there are other boundaries that... Uh, Is that where that saying came from? Change your underwear every day, you might get hit by a bus. <laughs> you get hit by a bus. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Usually the first thing that happens when you get hit by a bus is that you dirty your underwear. So it really doesn't matter what, what you've done or whether they're clean. Clean or not. That's usually the first thing that happens. And that's the last thing we care about. Uh, in, in helping relationships, oh maintaining appropriate boundaries is an essential part of developing a uh, trusting relationship with a client. Relationship boundaries must be maintained with delicacy. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why you should never try to uh, deal with a relative mm -hmm. or somebody that you know. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. If you, uh, uh, of course, if you're living in a big city, if you're living in Albuquerque, you're living in Phoenix, it's easy not to have anything to do with anybody that you've ever met before. But if you're living in Saley, what's the probability you're not going to run into a relative? I mean, like everybody is your relative if you're from here. So if you are a social worker here, that's tough. It's really hard. Uh, when we were living in Montana, there were like eight counselors in the whole damn state of Montana, and half of them were in Missoula. Um, there's one in Billings, and there's one in Great Falls, but uh, we had one up in, uh, up along the uh, uh, two, we were, there's a highway that goes across the top of Montana. It's uh, National Highway 2. Uh, anyway, there's Haver, and there's, there's Chinook, and there's, but we only had one counselor, and so she, she had to, I mean, she was the only counselor in the area, so she had to deal with everybody. 
and she was from back east, but um, after she'd been there for a couple of years and went to the bar every other night, uh, she pretty much knew everybody. <laughs> and as it turned out, as it turned, of course she wasn't married, and as it turned out, she started dating her clients. Well, I mean, there were no other people to date, and eventually she married one of her clients, which was kind of interesting. I don't know. Anyway, so there are supposed to be boundaries, and it's easy in a in a uh, urban environment, not so easy in a rural environment. Sexual relationships with clients are forbidden by all professional codes and represent the most common ethical uh, complaints against helping professionals. Uh, sometimes you will see individuals, this is relatively rare, but and, and they don't last for very long, but you'll see sexual predators becoming counselors. And what they will do is they will, they will, uh, they will uh, prey on their, on their clients. Uh, and of course, it usually doesn't last very long. They can't last very long because they're breaking all kinds of ethical codes. Uh, and as soon as they break up with somebody, they usually get sued and, and kicked out of the profession. But, I mean, we do see this, and it's really kind of sad. Sometimes you'll see school counselors, especially male school counselors, who, who are, some of, some of them are predators. It's a rare, it, it tends to be relatively rare, but I mean, we do see this. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you do see it, you need to get rid of it. In one uh, study, 7 to 8 percent of practitioners reported engaging in sexual intimacy with a client. 7 to 8 percent. Really? 7 to 8 percent? That's like 12. What's it? Seven to eight percent, that's like one out of every 12 mm -hmm. counselors. That's a, lot. that's a lot of people. That is a lot. That's a ton. That's, too many. that's just not right. And if you've ever, there, there was a movie about uh, Barbara Streisand and Nick Nolte. Uh, and Nick Nolte is the client <coughs> for Barbara Streisand. And eventually they marry. They, get, they, they start having an affair and they get married. As ugly as that is, it's not. wasn't supposed to happen. It was, a, it was, <laughs> it was not a very good book. Sexual relationships can have seriously negative effects on your clients. Uh, cognitive dysfunction because they're confused as to what's going on. What's right and what's wrong, exactly. Identity and boundary disturbances. Sexual confusion, especially if, it's, uh, if that is, is their issue, has to do with uh, uh, their sexual orientation. Uh, rage and feelings of guilt, depression and emptiness, uh, self-destructive feelings, and of course, increased risk of suicide if, they, if that takes place. But if we're dealing with 7 to 8 percent of the counselors are having uh, improper uh, relationships with their clients, now we got a really serious problem. This is, that's a lot of counselors, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Touch, accepting gifts and self-disclosure by professionals or behaviors that have potential to be boundary violations depending on the circumstance. More damage can be done by overstepping boundaries than the help previously given. And so we have to be very careful. Uh, you have to read things. Uh, I, I've told you that uh, Sarah and I, uh, Sarah's from Canada and I'm from Indiana and I'm, I have, I'm of English extraction. So uh, this is about as close to people as I like to get. But there are other individuals that are touchers, and they will just kind of grab your shoulder, grab your arm, touch you. I hate it when people grab, they grab, you know? I don't mind if they touch. Touching's okay, but if they grab somebody, it's almost like they're trying to control. Mm -hmm. And you'll see this in a movie, and you want to, you know, punch James Bond for grabbing that chick or something, you know? That's not right. You want to stop watching James Bond movies or something. I mean, it just doesn't seem right. So you have to be careful, and you, and you never know. You never know if uh, this individual is from Canada or this individual is from, I don't know, Los Angeles, where everybody hugs. And they do, they do that uh, the air kiss thing, where they, they, they don't kiss their cheeks, but they kiss beside their cheeks. <laughs> as weird as that is. Oh, it gives me the wind when I'm... Anyway, so yeah, so some people are touchers and some people aren't touchers. I am a toucher, except I, uh, if I'm conversing with you, I don't want to be in your face. <laughs> this is about as, this is, I feel comfortable now, this is okay. Do you see what I'm talking about? And you never know, you just never know. 
If somebody's French, uh, the French like to touch people. They like to stand beside you. And as you're talking, they like to touch you to make sure that you're listening. <laughs> and it's the French. Kind of interesting people. <laughs> You know, it's interesting watching French people visit like Powell. You know, I lived on that side of the reservation. I grew up on that side of the reservation, actually. And a lot of French over there? During the summers, yeah, tourists. they come tourists. They come really? to the lake. And I remember growing up and always seeing French people inside Walmart wearing nothing but flip flops and thongs. That's it. That's it. That's all they'll wear. You know. And the women are walking, you know, with the bikini, and so it's so funny watching, you know, the Navajo's reaction to these French people. Nylon to negative. Well, not only that, but they have an odor about them. Yeah, they? Yes, they yeah, do. Okay. yeah. So that that kind of makes it over the top even more for Grandma to have. I mean, Grandma just that. Yeah. But it's uh, so it's funny me, like, watching that whole dynamic. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> yes, they do have an odor about them. <laughs> Yeah, you know when in you're order, uh, in a presence. <laughs> <laughs> you know if you're in line with somebody who's French and they're right in front of yeah, you. Yeah, you can feel that. Oh yeah. Feel well, except for all the skin. <laughs> there is a difference between city ethics and rural small town reservation boundary ethics. Uh, it is easy for a city practitioner to gravitate in different circles than clients, but of course if you live in a small town or you live on the reservation, the probability of staying away from your clients is fairly remote. My so sister, now you've got to pretend that yeah. you know, you've never met this person before. Like my <laughs> sister was seeing this counselor, and this counselor got drunk and ran into my dad's RV. Oh, no. And like moved it five feet in this brand new RV and everything. And so my sister went back to go see the counselor, and um, and they have her on video and everything. But anyway, she switched her to a different counselor because of that. Oh my good! Well, of course they did. Yeah, yeah. they have to. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, small town USA. Actually, there are a lot more small towns in the United States than there are urban areas. Uh, but the reality, and there are the vast majority of people don't live in cities, they live in small towns mm -hmm. in the United States, but there are very few counselors in these small towns. Yeah. As I told you before, almost all the counselors in Montana live in Missoula. Uh, almost all the counselors in Arizona live in Phoenix. There's a shock for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. uh, and why? Why in the world would the counselors live in Phoenix? Why don't they live where they're needed? Culture shock for them. Too much the culture shock? Being so far away from. Mommy and daddy? Being too far <laughs> away from the corner store. <laughs> okay, well, come on. Our counselor psychologists need their bourbon. Deal they with do this. need their bourbon. I won't argue that <laughs> point. <laughs> bourbon. So, why would they live in. Bourbon. Uh, well, what's going on with Denver besides the bourbon? Why, why, why do almost all the counselors live in Denver? Don't relapse. <laughs> you know I don't drink. <laughs> uh, what a flavor. Ugh. So why, why do they all live in urban areas? Are you ready for this? Are you sure? This may break your heart. Money. It's money. That's why they live in the urban areas. They can make more money. Wait a minute. You're supposed to go into to counseling to help people, not to make money. Yeah. Right? People gotta eat. People gotta well, live. I know they gotta live, and they they're used to having <coughs> yachts and Mercedes Benz, and oh, I know. Oh, I just my yacht is just not big enough. I need a bigger one. <laughs> I know. That's 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 why I'm here. That's why I'm here. I'm here. Oh, hey. I'm here at the reservation. To and make, then you got your own personal for the big parking bucks. lot right there for it, right there in the little lake. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> like second hand lines. Grandpa lives up by that big yacht. <laughs> uh, I don't even have an lake. office where I can <laughs> not hear everybody's <laughs> conversations. Uh, the desire to help the people in the community that were they were raised in is very strong. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of you may be thinking, uh, well, I'm, I'm doing this so that I can go back home and I can help all of those kids in high school uh, just like I should have been helped when I was in high school. The probability is that 
going back to your own hometown is probably not the best idea. No, that's the, probably the worst idea in the world because you already know all these people. And strangely enough, it's going to skew the way that you counsel people because you knew you know this person's grandparent, you know what problems the grandparent has, so you're assuming that that's the problem with the kid. Wait a minute, is that true? Shouldn't you talk to the kid before you figure out what the problem is? Not, and not treat them for what the problem that their grandparent had or their uncle had. So if you have all this information, a lot of times it will skew the way that you treat the, the client, and that's really not a very good thing. And that's one of the reasons why going back home to help is not the best idea in the world. Is that why yeah. a lot of the alcohol counseling that's done doesn't isn't very successful right. because of the counselors that are doing it? Or it may not be from the community, but right. they're from the same nationality, the same culture, the same tradition, so it's kind of just an assumption. Well, actually, uh, if if they are from the same culture and they're using traditional methods, the probability uh, that they help the individual is very high because they understand the traditions. They understand part of what has caused them to become an alcoholic. Which, I mean, they, they either had to ignore their traditions in order to become an alcoholic or, or their tradition tells them that they have to be part of the community. And, yeah, and they have become part of the lifestyle of the community that, that drinks. Okay. Does that make sense? <coughs> so if you're planning on going back home and, and helping your uncle or your cousin or all, their, all your nephews and nieces, probably not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. Uh, well, counseling? What, yeah, what you if need? you already kind of had like a a detachment from that from the very beginning. It's possible. And you're doing it outside of you way back in. Well, that's possible. It's possible. Okay. It really depends on you and also depends on the community. If you had a negative experience in the community, sometimes you're going to try to yeah, get revenge try to get on revenge, that community yeah. by... Uh, I like my community. I grew up in it. Okay. No revenge. No, no revenge. revenge. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's so, gotten to where I wanted them to be. So exactly. So now, now everybody's in the right place. <laughs> when you know the client before trying to help them, uh, you are maintaining a dual relationship, and you should try to avoid this. Uh, you may be trying mm -hmm. to help them. You think that uh, their biggest problem is something that happened to them when they were 16 years old, and now, of course, they've got a new problem, but you can't not think of them as, you know, Okay. Droopy drawers or whatever you used to, the nickname you used to call this individual, you cannot take them out of that person that they were when they were in high school or whatever, or in grade school. You can't remove yourself. You can't remove that piece of information from your brain. And you're, you will always be dealing with them like this individual. It's one of the reasons why, well, I still call my kids my babies. My my daughter's 49 years old. I mean, calling her a baby doesn't make any sense whatsoever. My son, even though the kid's not potty trained yet, is 40, 46. Oh <laughs> he's 46 and he's a math major and he takes classes that I don't even understand what they're talking about. I don't even understand the title of the classes that he's taking. And I still call him my baby. And my, and my six-year-old grandson, I still refer to him as my baby. These are my babies. So the reality is you can't remove that piece of information. They will always be your great babies. You will always be dealing with them uh, as, as they were when you were messing around with them when they were 16 years old. Okay. Does that make sense? You can't forget who they are. You can never counsel your relatives because you were, well, it's, as long as you knew your relatives. I, did, I didn't like my relatives, so I could counsel mine. <laughs> Would it work in a vice versa situation as well? Would yeah. they know you in a certain way? Yeah, yeah, they would, yeah. So that they just can't well, learn think, from you? Exactly. They don't ever give you the credit that you deserve. They, they treat you like... they already made up their mind. Exactly. They treat you the same way they treated you when you were 15, and now you've got a PhD, and they're still calling you, you know, whatever. the jackass or whatever. <laughs> And they're still putting, and at Thanksgiving, they still put you at the kitty table. Oh, wait a minute, that's not right. You've always sat at the kitty table. You should be. Right? Nice. I still sit at the kitty table, okay? I know. It's, 
distressing you, depressing you. It didn't hurt, doesn't hurt me. I'll be okay. Be aware uh, that if you take on this task, you are possibly an ethical violation. Okay, I got a couple minutes. I got another one. Another challenge during your professional relationship is how much information about yourself you should disclose to the client. Uh, I'm obviously an individual that tells stories, therefore I tell you a lot about my family. Uh, I've disclosed a lot of information. It's my way of teaching. It's, uh, I, I, it makes my teaching more personal. It makes me feel better about myself. It's cathartic because I get to talk to all my relatives. Uh, but uh, you may not want to do that. That may not be part of who you are. You may not want to disclose any information. The more information you disclose, the more, the more, the greater the probability that you're dealing with your problems, not their problems. So you need to be careful as to how much information you disclose. Self-disclosure should only be used in the best interest of the client, certainly not the practitioner. This is, uh, okay, this is something that I see all the time. An individual will be counseling a select individual. Uh, one person says, well, you know, when I was in college, I, I was a member of the, the mile relay team, and I ran uh, a 321. And you're going, and so I ran, I ran in college too, but I ran a 317. So should I tell them that? No. But we see this all the time. It's like a one-upsmanship, and all of a sudden we're not counseling anymore. Now we're, we're having a pissing contest to yeah. see who can urinate the farthest. Yeah. Exactly. I know. A pissing contest. Okay, why don't we stop right here? We'll pick this up next time. <laughs> With the